Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Uh, I'm Francis Sullivan, uh, CTO and co-founder of a company here in Austin, uh, Spiceworks. And uh, today I was going to just talk about uh, some of the lessons we've learned and some of the tips we learned uh, using Ruby and Ruby on Rails in the last few years. Uh, the agenda was going to be, uh, I'm just going to kind of show you our product, you'll get it right away. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you our product, we don't actually charge for our product, so no reason to sell it to you. Uh, I was going to then cover some things that we think are pretty interesting that you may or may not find interesting, but uh, since I think it's interesting and I'm talking, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, updating remote installations, we have uh, a whole bunch of installations out in the field and uh, uh, we have logic to keep them up to date with the, with the current stuff that we're deploying. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, performance of Ruby uh, on uh, the Windows operating system. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a very trivial example of how we avoid uh, deadlock in some situations. Uh, I'm going to walk you through an extension we wrote that uh, uh, lets us uh, use Active Record to do work to keep track of things. And then I'm going to uh, walk you through, uh, finally, a, a tweak, tweaks that we've gone through on our uh, network scanner that actually uh, make it faster. Uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people here from Austin? I, I can't tell you how amazing that is to me because, you know, three years ago when we started Spiceworks, I didn't even hardly know what Ruby was. Okay. So, uh, it's on. Can you hear me now? Yep. There you go. Uh, so, uh, uh, Seeing that many people here from Austin, of course, it's a local conference, but you know, when I signed up to uh, talk here, I was thinking maybe 50 or 100 people, so uh, this is uh, uh, quite, quite amazing to me. Uh, I'm going to just uh, quickly go over what, what Spiceworks does. We, we build uh, software for uh, small, medium business uh, IT people to keep track of. Uh, keep track of their inventory, uh, solve tickets, and things like that. We, uh, like I said, we were founded in uh, January 2006. Uh, we just, we, our mission when we found, found was to uh, simplify uh, IT management for small, medium business. Uh, at the time when we launched, we were the first free ad-supported IT application. Uh, now ad-supported is uh, becoming more in vogue. And today, 450,000 IT pro shops uh, or IT pros are using Spiceworks in 196 countries. Our app isn't even internationalized. And uh, we have uh, under management 20 million devices by those installations and 13 million users by those. Uh, so those IT managers are managing 13 million users. And our, our tagline, we're trying to build the app for everything IT. Uh, this is a quick, uh, just a timeline of a day of an IT guy. We, we would love it if uh, they used us every day because guess what, uh, we're ad supported. We don't get paid unless you use the app. <laughs> so uh, uh, our initial product, we built something that inventoried your network and took uh, inventory of everything you have. So your computers, your printers, your software, your hardware, yada, yada, yada. And then we, uh, built in a community into our application that uh, uh, lets you get advice and expertise from uh, uh, people in the Spiceworks community. And uh, actually built a help desk in the Spiceworks so you could uh, solve problems uh, that users have uh, electronically and, and interact with them electronically. And then uh, you could then turn around and share best practices with uh, other Spiceworks users in the field and uh, hopefully eventually buy products and services with Spiceworks. Test one two. Uh, 
Okay, so and quickly go over our architecture. So uh, this is kind of interesting. Our, we have a cloud, uh, a, web, a web farm, running a bunch of Linux servers running Ruby on Rails. Uh, that's our cent central server. Our, our Spiceworks application is actually installed uh, on a Windows computer inside the small medium business environment. It was actually not designed that way. It was designed to be hosted. Our, our app was designed to be hosted like uh, Salesforce and those things, but it turned out when we actually started deploying peop people and talking to them, they didn't want their private inventory data leaving their network. So we end up uh, deploying on the local machine using Ruby on Rails in that framework as well. Uh, and uh, the UI and everything is driven from a web server launched from that Windows computer uh, right there on site. It's kind of interesting though, we kind of backed into this when we were originally going to, uh, originally going to uh, host all those, we have 450,000 plus installations of this uh, sitting there. If we had to host all those servers, it would be a nightmare. We, we don't have the money to do that. So we actually, uh, this hybrid model where you actually install something locally on, on the site, actually uh, for us in scaling is huge. Uh, we started with just three developers uh, and counting me and uh, our alpha version we had out in, in three months from when we started. Uh, I, I just wanted to quickly go over why we uh, chose Ruby on Rails. We had a Java background, .NET, XML, Spring, name, the name your favorite bingo framework. Uh, we had all that expertise, or I had played with it before. You know, it only takes a year or two to write something in that. It's, it's, it's pretty fast. But the problem is we couldn't afford 20 developers. And uh, we had to do something in three months, not a year. We had to be on time. We couldn't delay something three months and uh, try to do all that stuff. So uh, we needed something that was fast. Uh, but we also needed something that could scale with us. Uh, and I heard a rumor. Actually, the other day, uh, uh, Jason in the class I took said that he, he told me Rails doesn't scale, so still, still kind of a rumor out there. And uh, uh, in January 2006, uh, it was for us, it was kind of a risky technology. Uh, I looked through the documentation; it was pretty, pretty sketchy. And uh, I was uh, at the time we were looking through Python too. Had some great documentation, well, uh, pretty well founded stuff. And I was, uh, I was pretty set on using Python to do what we were doing. Uh, and then my other developer that was working at the time, uh, who was working on a prototype, in two days prototyped a system that in Java would have taken weeks. And he wasn't saying, look what I can do. He was saying, look how cool this Ruby on Rails thing is. <laughs> and I was just looking at the passion in his face. And that I can do anything if you let me use this tool. And you know, I thought about it for a while, and you know, uh, I thought it was a little riskier, but you know, I, I actually don't read documentation, so <laughs> the Python thing, uh, yeah. And I just saw the other day the Django's finally out, so uh, we could always switch later, maybe. Uh, Swice works today. We're, we're adding about 1,200 businesses a day, so uh, I mean, I was just saying about scalability. Uh, we're doing just fine. Uh, I wanted to talk about now kind of some lessons to learn on, on handling this. So uh, when we have half a million installations of Ruby on Rails distributed across uh, uh, people, small, bu small businesses across the world, and we want to put on an update, you know, the original, the original idea when we were thinking about it was can't we just update everybody every time we get a change? You know, maybe I check in a line of code, everyone gets it, we're all good. You know, we write tests sometimes, and you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> uh, you know, on support, it'd be trivial because it would always be up to date with the latest and greatest, and you know, it's nirvana. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes when we came up with things, we got the model wrong, or. We had to migrate data from one model, one, one record to another, and some people, even though we're targeting people with 250 devices, some people had 1,000 devices or 2,000 devices, or and if I'm using an app and all of a sudden it's upgraded underneath me, it's kind of confusing. So, 
So, uh, oh, and then this, the great Windows, uh, you have to use, <laughs> the easiest way to replace a DLL on Windows is to, is to restart the application. And then if we had all our servers uh, up in the farm in the sky and you uh, uh, put an update out, they get hammered, of course. So that, that, that original Nirvana thing, yeah, we had to back off a little bit. So next idea we came up with is, hey, how about user uses a Spiceworks application if we ever put an update out, if they, re if they happen to restart, we'll just sneak it in when they restart and uh, life will be good. Sports happy, everyone's on the latest release. Uh, unfortunately, many people rarely restart. They'll install Spiceworks on a server in the small medium business and then that service runs for months. So, uh, <laughs> I said support was happy a minute ago. They're actually not happy. It's a headache. And now, now the, the additional headache is someone, uh, someone just restarts. They don't know they're taking a, an update. And the app completely changes out from un, underneath them. So we were making rapid changes in the app. And they end up, uh, they, they end up having the app completely change underneath them. So that, you know, that's no good. Uh, next, next idea was. How about we update when a user gives the OK? So uh, we tell the user there's an update available. They uh, go ahead and walk through the update process. It's kind of manual, uh, but it gives them time to get educated and plan, and, and they can go read the community and see if other people applied it and you know, not be the first who's got an iPhone brick. Uh, Still, issue is a, a user would end up with a minor issue for months, months at a time because uh, you know people get nagged to update all the time from software all over the place. So now support uh, has to worry about ten, uh, multiple versions in the in the back when people are running the issues that we fixed months ago and they're still they're still behind because they haven't updated. And I mean the obvious current implementation is a hybrid approach. Uh, what we do is if someone, if there's an, a major update available that has to replace DLLs and things like that, we tell them and they go through the upgrade process. Uh, if we have a minor, what I would call template change, a tweak, uh, we can just push that out uh, effectively between page clicks. Users clicking on a page. Uh, uh, none of you guys ever have IE6 problems or CSS. Nothing like that. You know, ours, when we write them, they're right the first time. Well, maybe. I got half our dev team sitting here, and they're going to kill me after this. Uh, yeah, it's embarrassingly, you misspell a word on a page. Well, it's stuck there for months unless you have an easy way to update it. So uh, very, very simple uh, approach here. Our, our application, the Ruby, Ruby container sitting on the small medium business, makes a heartbeat call up to our main servers. The update manager says, hey, uh, uh, here's a major version, here's a minor version. And, and then the update is pretty easy. Am I on the current version? No. Tell them they should update. Am I on the minor version? No. Just replace the gems right there on the fly. And that brings up a slight, a slight trick is how do you do that? So uh, if you're in development mode in Rails, it's not a problem. You just you change whatever you want, and everything seems to work. Uh, in production mode, it's not so easy. So uh, one of our developers figured this out. They kind of looked at the way the demo did it and wrote a custom Mongo handler that would, we broke our system up into 10, 15 gems, and then the gems and the file paths that those are on are all handled by this Mongo handler. And then as soon as we want to update it, we, we uh, lock Mongrel, we switch the, the paths, and remove all, all, the, uh, all the current templates. This is the simple code from uh, Active Record that clear, clears the templates after they get loaded in. So it's not, it's not rocket science here. So I'm going to slightly switch gears. Uh, Ruby performance. So uh, Ruby, you know, for per performance-wise, for Perl, things like Perl Ruby, it seems pretty fast. But uh, we, did, we did notice one thing. Stock Ruby on Windows, I guess that's the one we downloaded from OneClick or wherever we were getting it from three years ago, seemed much slower running on Windows than it did on Mac OS X or Linux. 
you know, after last night, I can see why it runs faster on Linux. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. We had a, a, a VMware server. We had a, a Fedora running on it. We ran the Ruby benchmarks in there. And on the same host, same host operating system Windows, ran the benchmark from there from a command.exe window, 40% slower. That's like, you know, so like you do a migration, and now it takes twice as long, or whatever it is, it's slower. I, I still can't believe, because it always seems slower walking around saying, yeah, it's slower, you know, it's Windows, whatever. Uh, and then we finally benchmarked it and said, you got to be kidding me. How could it be that much slower? Uh, our initial approach was, uh, we're just going to wait for the next version. You know, someday we'll get this new 191, new version of Rails. You know, things are getting better all the time. Uh, well, we started, we started getting, adding a bunch of stuff to our app and, and speed became a slight, slight issue. So I uh, had one of our developers, you know, while we're waiting, why don't you see if there's anything that can be done? And uh, is, this is actually pretty interesting. So he cracks open the, uh, the Ruby uh, build files for uh, Windows, uh, MSVC optimization flag is off. He goes, well, that's kind of interesting. Turns it on, a bunch of things don't compile because a bunch of things are broken. He actually tracked them down, like regex, string, pack scan, random. There's a, a few places in the Ruby code that uh, can't be optimized by the Microsoft optimizer. Once those are fixed, you can turn the optimization flag on, and of course, you get uh, better performance. And this is, this is also kind of interesting because we, we don't have a profiler that runs on Windows, so we, don't, we haven't spent that money on that. So basically ran gprof on a, on a Unix type machine, uh, looking for hotspots in a val.c. Uh, actually read this paper down here uh, talking about what compilers do and, and what things uh, manage performance. And uh, one of the things that was in there is if you change a function call from a C deco call to fast call, it's actually about 2% faster uh, calling fast call. So you hit a function in a val.c, they get hit all the time. You hit you hit fast call, you get a two percent uh, uh, improvement, and then many of the calls you make in the Val C might, might call six, eight, ten functions. So, so that two percent starts adding up across all the function calls. That's the URL, and, th and this is the results. It's kind of kind of interesting. It didn't do. It's not a whole lot of work. Uh, you guys can have the diffs if you want them. It's. Uh, but you see it's 25, 30, 40% faster now just by doing those couple tweaks. Now that, this, this interesting one, loop time and the benchmark, we actually have a few loops in our code, so that helped out a lot. Okay, uh, the, while we're still waiting, uh, the next thing we're doing right now is uh, looking at MSVC 9, Visual Studio 2008. Uh, I guess there's this uh, cross-module optimization in the compiler that can look across modules and optimize things together. And then uh, this other concept of running Ruby in our environment and uh, profiling it to guide the optimization, that, that concept seems promising too. But you end up, I think you end up with a tweaked version of Ruby for your environment then. Uh, I got a free tip, if you're ever running a software company and uh, you need to get a push out on the weekend, make sure the office space you rent you know, has control of the heat and air conditioning. <laughs> uh, this is a picture from us last January when we released our 2.1 uh, release. It was, I think it was in the 20s in Austin. Happens every once in a while. It was probably 45 degrees while we were trying to do this. You see uh, Kevin here, he's got gloves on. I was watching him try to tie put those on. That was, that's pretty funny to do a deployment with uh, uh, bear mitts on. Uh, Justin, he's in the audience. He's got bubble wrap around him to keep him warm because he, he said it worked. I think it looked funny. Uh, we now have on-site control. Uh, the release before that in the summer, it was 100 degrees on the weekend and there's no air conditioning, so it's worse. You, everyone stinks when you're doing that. So. Uh, next thing I want to talk about was uh, a Ruby on Rails plugin that we wrote that allowed uh, customers to 
tack on additional attributes to the things that we, their devices or their tickets, and override existing attributes that are on those things. Here we have uh, a uh, detailed panel from a device that's uh, got a bunch of information about the device, the last user, the owner, the name of it, its IP address, its model number, so, so and so. But we have that asset tag highlighted because the scanner, when it collected the information off this machine, couldn't find one, so it, it basically put in a blank asset tag. The user actually, the IT guy actually has a spreadsheet with the asset tag on it, so he'd actually like to put the real asset tag in there without fixing the scanner, so to do it right, you would just like to be able to type it in. Uh, so, you know, our, our Rails model, we got a column on devices called asset tag as a string, but the problem is we now have two owners. The scanner thinks it owns it, and the Spiceworks main app thinks it owns it. Of course, the user's always right, so the Spiceworks main, main app owns it. If he, type, he clicks at it, types at it, types in the real value and saves it, uh, we, re we remember that value, so, you know, not, not that hard, but next time the scanner runs, the way it was implemented before, it would just wipe that out because it's got blank for an asset tag and that must be right from the scanner's point of view. So we, we wrote this uh, access modifiable plugin that uh, uh, you could programmatically control things like this. So our device model actually has this uh, additional thing that asset tag is an overridden column. And then that allows you to do things like, well, it, added, it adds a new method uh, called base underscore. So if you say base underscore, I will show you the default one was blank. Uh, if I set, if the user set the asset tag to ABC123 like I showed you in the UI, uh, I, just, for, just for clarity's sake, I set the base at, asset tag from the scanner to a tag from scanner. Uh, the asset tag from the scanner uh, then is not displayed. If you look at asset tag, it's actually the one the user typed in. Then if I clear out the asset tag, it moves back to the one from the scanner. Uh, another example that's kind of very similar in the same plugin is uh, uh, a user has attributes that they want to add to our, to our model. I have cust1 and cust2, custom attribute 1-2, but it could be something like an office or uh, whatever they want to track. This is also programmatically, programmatically controlled and uh, that, that UI right there actually uh, runs this, this type of uh, Ruby, and then it ends up uh, creating new columns in the, in the SQL schema, and then Active Records does the work. Uh, so there they are, they show up when he typed them in, and now they're on the model, and, and everything we do from reporting to whatever has those new custom attributes on it. Uh, I do want to say we, we took a couple attempts at this. The first attempt we used the, uh, the classic BNF format where we had a separate table with overrides on it and then it had a one-to-many relationship, actually polymorphic because it was device or ticket, uh, that lets you have overrides in that, in that uh, subsequent table. The, 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 issue, the big issue with that is every time you get something from Active Record now you have to do a join through those tables to get the overridden values. So if you start looking at the SQL that's coming from Active Record, they start getting longer and longer. You start joining through other things. You end up with pages of SQL where, where it would have been, in our case, it ends up to be much simpler just to have it right on the model itself. Uh, we had on site, I, I had an architecture there. We have a SQLite database. Uh, that sits in, sits in the customer environment and it has all the data collected from inventory and the tickets and all that in it. Uh, and our initial, initial way we deployed it, we have uh, uh, Ruby on Rails running the Spiceworks main app. Uh, we have uh, it doing the reading and writing to the database. And then when the scanner wanted to send data up to, up to, uh, up, up to the installation, it actually used HTTP to post it through the server server is single threaded, so now you know, there's no deadlock here because uh, when the scanner writes data, it it's all has exclusive access, and then if the user's using the web server at the same time, he just waits for the scanner to finish whatever it's writing, and he gets in right after that. 
Uh, this worked fine for our first release. Uh, unfortunately, we started adding more and more data to the scanner. So when it was running, it could just hammer the web app uh, to a point where you couldn't get in uh, if, you're, if you were the desktop admin. Uh, another interesting fact is 30% of the time of the scanner in this case was used uh, to marshal the data over HTTP. So it actually slowed down the scanner, slowed down the app. And so what we really wanted was uh, multiple database writers. We wanted the scanner to write directly to the database and uh, Spicer's main app to write directly to the database. They're separate processes. As long as only one is writing, it's actually not a problem. Uh, SQLite handles it pretty well. If both are writing, you get, this, you get a deadlock issue. Uh, uh, you know, deadlock's not good because uh, you get starved. Uh, the, uh, we did find for SQLite, uh, uh, James Buck wrote this deadlock retry plugin and we took it down, thought we were all done. Turned out it was three years old and it didn't work for the commit side. But uh, we ended up tweaking it so that it work, worked in our environment. And then we had a special, special consideration is when the IT admin is using the desktop, we want him to have priority over the scanner. I mean, if the scanner has to stall waiting, that's no big deal. We want the guy using the app to get priority. So we, had, we tweaked it so that uh, if the Spiceworks app is, uh, is trying to get, get access to it and the scanner's blocking it, uh, we basically signal the scanner that the app is in distress, uh, the app itself, uh, waits for a minute and then the scanner sees that and stops writing, goes into a sleep. Uh, the, the app then gets access to the database, the user gets his data, and now deadlock's avoided. That, yeah, that seems pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. It's kind of a classic textbook deadlock avoidance. Uh, the interesting thing is when we started looking, uh, everyone was saying you couldn't do it with SQLite, so you can if you want. So, you know, this is probably the biggest lesson we've learned, but I've seen a lot of talks. Everyone says this. I'm just going to just say it again. It's, it's easy to pile on. You have to know who your user is. Uh, one interesting thing that we did in our, in our app, though, is uh, so we know who our user is. These are pictures from site visits for site SpiceWorks users. We visit them all the time. But we also built in our app feedback, and they can tell us exactly what they want. I can't tell you as a developer how interesting it is to have a, a conversation about what to build next and then say, hey, what do they want? Oh, we should probably build that because if we build what they want, they'll use it. If they use it, we can run ads. Hey, that's a great idea. Instead of sitting in a, in a product discussion and saying, we want this, we want that, and you know, you know how that goes. Next thing is uh, we only have three full-time support people, and with you know close to half a million uh, users, that's not very many. So we actually build a community right in where people they can look at FAQs and fix things. And a lot of our SpiceWorks users spend their free time solving problems for other people. It's, it's kind of interesting, uh, and some of them actually probably know it better than us. But we also, we also have our developers uh, uh, watch this. Uh, and this is like a this is like a secret secret sauce, if you will. Our developers can figure out what people are having problems with, so the next time they work on something that's related to it, they can actually make it so that other people understand. I'm just going to go over the really simple example of that. This is our monitors and alerts page. It's it's pretty cool. It's got uh, Ajaxy stuff all over it. These are shipped out of the box. Uh, some users don't even know we have monitors and alerts, but they're shipped out of the box and they're configured automatically for them. Uh, just that top one there, any disk space, you know, if the disk is less than 25% free, they'll get a monitor on a device when we scan it. Uh, pr pretty straightforward. Well, we had one guy in the support thing saying, well, that monitor's no good. Uh, I only care about if it's 10% free. And it's kind of interesting, there's a, there's a line right there in the UI that says to edit a monitor set and click on it. Uh, but if you're not a Ajax kind of guy and you're used to old web forms, 
Can you honestly tell from this that you can edit it? I mean, you could read it and figure it out, but can you honestly tell? You actually, in ours, you have to, you have to hover over and turn it yellow. See, now, now that's giving you a hint that you can edit it. And if you click on it, then you get a drop. You, you click on it, it switched to a drop down. So you didn't know it was a drop down before. Pretty slick, isn't it? Uh, then you click the drop down. Of course, he has all the options he ever wanted to do, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, you give up, for some usability things, you give up, or clean, cleanliness for UI, you give up usability. And we're actually working on this now. We're going to make it more apparent that you can actually edit that without having to read the text on what's going on. But this is a, this is a common struggle for us. I, you, there was that thing a, a few weeks ago showing uh, a guy said he showed a picture of a five-pointed star, how many dots are on the star, and they pulled the audience, and they got numbers from five to, I don't know, 15. It was something, and I, it was, I was just baffled at that. But, I mean, we face that every day in our app, but it's interesting, going back to our secret sauce, our developers are exposed to this every day because they actually get into the, into the community and help figure out what's going on with people. I can't emphasize that enough. Know who you're building your software for. Build what they want. The last thing we have is this built-in community for the users. This is kind of uh, uh, interesting, or they just kind of, I know it's all the latest buzz, social networking, but they have groups, they, they self-form, they start talking about stuff. You, uh, I mean, this Active Directory group, when they started it, it now gets like 10 posts a day, you can't keep up with it. Uh, it's kind of, we didn't really, des I mean, maybe when we thought about it, we thought people would use it, but actually using it actively, it's kind of kind of interesting. It's also kind of interesting if you ask one of our IT guys if they have any extra time to do anything else, they'll say, no, they're busy the whole time. And then, and then you'll see, like last week, that guy contributed 600 messages. So it's, it's, it's just kind of a, they might not think they're interested, but they get sucked in, they start helping other people. And uh, the fact that we don't charge for our software, that helps, that, that, that helps them feel like they're actually helping, helping the, the SwiceWorks cause. Okay, total, total veer down to a Ruby example. Uh, the Spiceworks scanner, uh, all it does is scan your network, looking for devices, classify what they are, and then get detailed information from them, like uh, uh, on, a, on a Mac OS Xbox, it'll log in over SSH, it'll start running a bunch of commands like DF or system properties to get the software. <laughs> On and on, on a Windows box, it'll connect to the Windows management framework and uh, grab a bunch of management information that way. On a, a router, it'll connect with SNMP and collect a bunch of information that way. But all in all, it's a pretty simple algorithm. It, uh, for each scan entry, a scan entry could be multiple devices, like a, a, a list of them. Uh, it normalizes them to, to make sure that it's only probing one device one time. And then for each one of those, it just has to classify them. And uh, after it classifies them, it knows what they are. It can go get de detailed information like I was talking about. Uh, well, yeah, that's pretty simple. It's, it's not exactly fast, though, because it's all linear. You just wait for the beginning and end. If you have a lot of, our design point was 250 devices. It actually, for our initial release, was plenty good enough. But if you, if you look at it, uh, Those two steps, the normalize and, the, uh, and then walking through each one to, to classify it. Well, yeah, this is classic Ruby. Uh, normalize to prospect should be yielding back results as it gets them. So you can change that to uh, this. And it's actually cleaner, less code. You get to classify the devices as they become available by the code. So that actually uh, improves performance a lot because the perception is waiting for all the entries to be scanned versus I found one, I found one, I found one. It's like it's actually doing something. Uh, the next thing you can see is that uh, that last map, once it goes and gets the detailed information, uh, that actually can be done in parallel as well. Uh, we actually have our own class that uh, wraps threads and a number of threads and walks around it. And uh, uh, this ends up. Uh, getting in parallel all the information from the devices uh, max threads at a time. So if you gave it 16 threads, it would run that 
obtain extended data 16 times in parallel and 16 different threads. Uh, you know, using thread, it's well documented. Using threads in, in the older Ruby is, is pretty difficult. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense, like uh, use an existing thread versus create a new thread. Uh, when you use, when you do hundreds and thousands of them, it's better to keep your existing ones. Uh, anyway, I, I know this is all getting better, so I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on it. I always thought this would be cool, though. Uh, just instead of we got the each operator on an array. I, I like this, uh, you know, just why can't I say reduce on an array and have it do the block against every element however it wants. I mean, I, I made up this arbitrary max threads thing. You know, ideally maybe max threads wouldn't even be passed in. The, the, the computer itself would figure out how to do that in parallel across all, the, all those things. I think that would be, I think that would be really nice. Then, uh, I just got through talking about how cool that yield was, so it yields back the results in the middle. But you know, if that normal, if that normalized prospects thing takes a long time, that uh, that you still get starved. The classify thing still getting starved. So you you need to uh, you need to do both in parallel. So I have I've I've switched it up now. Interesting thing is when I switch it up, this is this is not very common for me in Ruby. Uh, Usually when I use Ruby and you add something, it gets cleaner. In this case, I'm not quite there yet because it's not, it doesn't look cleaner, it's more complicated. The first thing I'm doing there is setting up the, uh, the thing that'll do the work. And then as I get the work, I, as I get things to work on, I add it to the thing that does the work and then I wait for it to, 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 to finish. Uh, anyone else later, if you uh, see me in the hall and you've got a cleaner way to do this, I'm all ears. But this is currently currently how our scanner works, and uh, uh, you know that initial thing I was showing you, the the normalize plus classifies phase per device was taking about 25 seconds. You know, 250 devices, it's not not too bad. Might be an hour or so. Uh, now doing those two little things, switched it to four seconds a device, and then that, uh, when you actually fill in the details, went from 45 to 20 seconds doing it in parallel. There's a lot of data being collected there. Uh, subsequent scans are much faster because we, uh, we cache it. Uh, the other thing is we now collect about twice as much data as we did before. Oh, and it, uh, we, just, we just put a release out where that four seconds is two seconds because we wrote a custom uh, Ruby extension uh, in C to uh, do some of the pinging, and that, that actually made it faster still. Uh, are we going to rewrite this for Ruby 1.9? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this the fibers, the revector stuff. That all looks that looks really, really good. The stuff Moss is talking about about parallelization and the version after that. I'm sure we're going to be jumping all over that because even though it's a scanner, it's fast enough. You always want it to be as fast as possible. But I, I can say just looking at what they're doing and, and the stuff they're working on, I, its future is really promising for this kind of stuff. I have another tip. Uh, if you're into changing things in the UI, just be careful. Uh, so our, our users, we had this voting scheme where you vote for things you want, and we have a, a pepper, pepper icon with a count of how many people voted for it. Uh, well, our founder, uh, Scott Abel, our co-founder, Scott Abel, he, uh, he's really into the UI. And, I think he didn't like how much space that pepper was taking up, so we took it out and we used an up and a down arrow. So you could vote on it, kind of like dig. Uh, well, the users revolted after we did that, and they, they wanted their pepper back. <laughs> yeah, here, here's, the, here's the pepper. Uh, just, just mentally, I, this is kind of off the top of the head. I, I can probably think of 100 more if you gave me time, but. Things not to do, uh, you know, we originally had this uh, software versioning has multiple levels, 1.3.7.2, and our IP address is, is not sorted numerically. So we wrote this uh, Ruby extension that sorted uh, all the data that was coming, coming out. It's, it's actually quite easy to write a SQL -like extension to do, uh, to do whatever you want, and we were calling it. It works, it's just, it's really slow. I'd say if you're going to write something that needs to be fast, 
do that one in C. It's, 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 you're already in C down at the level anyway, so it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, this is another one that's kind of tough. We, we, uh, we, needed a, we needed a search in our app, and we have search in our app, we use Ferret. We used to use, uh, we used to use SQL and do queries and looking for strings and things like that. But uh, I'm not real happy with what we have with Ferret. Now, it could be we don't have it tuned right and we're gonna keep working on it, but if you came and asked me, hey, should I put Ferret in my app? I, I, would, I would say be very careful. Uh, and then this last one is like total no-brainer. Never do a major update without beta testing. Yeah, we actually did this once. It's not a good, the support guys is not happy. And I got one more thing here on this uh, Rails doesn't scale. This is uh, uh, our first UI when we released 1.0 in uh, whatever it was, May 2006. Uh, a few days before releasing it, we had a lot of white space in it, so I showed you a picture of Scott a minute ago. He had our UI guys put in this kind of this, uh, call it a dynamic report. It's got a bunch of dimensions of the data all sitting here. Uh, how many devices we found, what, how many were identified, which ones are currently online, what types they were, who the, who the OS is, are they static, dynamic, all, you, you can see it all. Pretty interesting. Well. We put this all in, we're about to release it, and all of a sudden, our little Rails app just started, just, just was, you know, take 10 seconds to load this page for just a small set of data. We, put, we had a guy with 1,000, 45,000 records, took 45 seconds to load this page. You know, it's, you know obviously it's because Rails doesn't scale. Well, well, actually, not quite. It's because we don't know how to program. Uh, we looked, looked at the query analyzer, 80 queries to do this. You know, how, how could that possibly be 80 queries? Well, it's easy. You uh, oh, found, oh, that's just uh, device.find uh, where type is not unknown. Uh, unknowns, device.find, count where type, you know. So you can see how you could easily get in that. The, the point is, you know, just take a look. Don't do stupid things. This is actually one or two queries in real life. Uh, it loads in under a second for very large subs uh, sets of data. It's just, you can blame something on the infrastructure you want, just make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, that's, that's pretty much all I got. I, I, uh, just a few parting shots. Uh, you, uh, you might think, well, I, you didn't really learn anything from what I said. Everything I said was pretty basic. It was basic deadlock detection, basic this, basic that. Yeah, it's right, it's pretty darn easy. That's pretty good for a software developer. I, Moss was talking about the, uh, where he learned how to program Fortran. Yeah, Fortran on cards. I, I dropped a deck of cards once. It took me an hour to get them back in place. That's, that was tough. <laughs> you couldn't do something like this like that. But, but what we got, we have the tools. We have people are writing gems. People are sharing stuff faster. You know, I hope someone comes up and tells me, hey, you did something, three things that are stupid. I, I'm all ears. I love, I love this stuff. This is, you can't get this in like you go to Microsoft development thing. It's just it's just a different different thing. This that's why that's kind of the cool thing about Ruby actually. Uh, the other thing, you know, this is totally obvious too. You know, good is good enough. You get something out there, you go, oh, this one page doesn't load. It takes ten seconds. How about just tweaking it and fixing it? The one thing about Ruby and the reason why we chose it in the end was, I can prototype something faster than I can document something. That's, uh, in Java, no way. I can write a, a Word document that describes what I wanted to do way faster than I could build it, if I could ever build it. So our, our way is, you have an idea, prototype it, we like it, we'll take it. We'll, it we're gonna tweak it, we tweak it. Write the document, I don't care about the document. Show me what it does. It's, uh, it, it, that's so empowering. You know, if I wanted to write documents, I would have majored in English. Yeah, guess what? Ruby and Rails scale just fine. Yeah, this is just so obvious, but, you know, this is, being a programmer, I can't tell you how much fun it is. I wake up in the morning, check my program, I look at it, I tweak it. People get paid to program and play with stuff like this. Be passionate, have fun, this is awesome. 
And that's pretty much all I got, unless you got, got any questions. Well, if you want to send me something or you want something, just send me an email. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.